My name is Carol Domeci and I am a Bundjalung woman, an Aboriginal woman from the far northern rivers of New South Wales. But I'm also a host guide for Parramatta City Heritage and Visitor Information Centre. So this was the traditional lands for the Parramatta Gold people who are part of the Darug Nation. Parramatta was rich in natural resources. Now, Aboriginal people would trade those resources between different clans. The governor had thoughts that trade would build friendly relations between the Aboriginal people and the early settlers. One of those early traders on behalf of the Aboriginal people was a young man called Balladerry. Now, Balladerry means leather jacket in Aboriginal language. And he was aptly named because he was a skilled fisherman. He was also the oldest son of uh, Darug elders, Magoran and Gurubera. And he had a brother and a sister, Bijibiji and Burong. When colonists arrived here in November 1788, they began clearing the land for building and farming. With their land taken, Balladerry's family moved to the river flats near Meadowbank. But what we know specifically about him comes to us from the journals and the diary entries of the early colonists. Balladerry was seen as a confident, likeable and resourceful young man with a strong sense of identity and of justice. By 1791, Balladerry had befriended Governor Philip and from the governor's diary entries, we can see he had a genuine affection for the young man. So in 1791, Balladerry and Colby, a young Gadigal man, were well, asked to go as guides on a government-led expedition to the Hawkesbury region. This expedition was led by Governor Arthur Phillip. It was common for Aboriginal people to be used in this manner because they could find fresh running water, they could navigate the land, and they could negotiate safe passage for the European settlers across other Aboriginal lands. David Collins, the judge advocate of the colony, was another member of the Hawkesbury expedition. His journal records that the party had been shooting water birds with Balladerry and Colby swimming out to bring in the dead birds. The colonists had been keeping the tastier ducks for themselves and giving crows and hawks to their Aboriginal guides. Eventually, Balladerry, his sense of justice invoked, refused to collect any more ducks. His moral stand led to a more equitable sharing of the food. As the expedition dragged on, Balladerry and Colby wanted to return to their own land, but their reason for wanting to return is interesting. At Rose Hill, they say, are potatoes, cabbages, pumpkins, turnips, fish and wine. This was where the early colonists first landed in Parramatta and the site became the settlement's wharf. It is likely that this is where early trading would have begun with Balladerry being one of the Darug entrepreneurs. He would have exchanged his fish for other commodities that were in limited supply, like those things that he had acquired a new taste for, potatoes and pumpkins. Balladerry decided to construct himself a new nawi or canoe, which was considered an essential tool for his trade of fishing. It was a time-consuming and complex process. Unfortunately, while Balladerry was trading with the soldiers one day, a group of convicts decided to destroy his nawi. David Collins says, his rage was inconceivable and he threatened to take revenge on all white people. All six convicts that had destroyed the Nawi were taken and punished, with one even being hanged, an event that the Aboriginal witnesses thought was barbaric. 
In an act of tribal retribution, Baladary attacked and wounded a convict on the outskirts of Parramatta. As a result, Governor Philip ordered Baladary be exiled from the colony. When Baladary much later ventured into town with some friends, armed parties were sent to seize him. However, he escaped. The governor ordered that he be captured and that any native attempting to defend him be punished as well. David Collins wrote, the natives being alarmed, Parramatta was seldom visited by them after this time. As a result, the trade in fish and other commodities ceased to exist. How much greater claim to the title of savage had the wretches who were the cause of this event than the native who was the sufferer? In December 1791, Baladere became gravely ill with the sudden onset of a high fever. He was pardoned by Governor Philip and the governor sent out a party to find him and to take him to Sydney Hospital for treatment. Alas, he was not able to be saved and he died a few days later. Baladere's funeral is seen as the first cross-cultural funeral in Australia, attended by a European community and by Aboriginal community, including Boorong and Colby. Baladere was buried in the grounds of Government House in Sydney. We can never know what prompted Baladere to assist and trade with the European settlers. But we can admire his confident, adventurous and ethical nature. Baladere should be celebrated as a person who, on his own terms, bridged the cultural divide between the early settlers and the Darug people. He was an enterprising and energetic young man who stood up for his rights, maintained tradition and adapted to a harsh new reality.